Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Feels like we've been away for quite a long time. We went on a uh, trip, if you're not aware, uh, back to Michigan. Uh, this past week, we left uh, last Sunday evening, I guess on a true red eye. The, we left at 11.59, so they pushed it out as late as you can on a Sunday night. Arrived in Detroit on Monday morning and then drove into Granville and uh, spent the rest of the week with uh, family. And um, we really did spend, I would say, probably 80% of our time with them. The rest of the time was just sleeping in the hotel and driving back and forth. There wasn't a whole lot to do because outside it was very cold and white. I think one day I got down to one degree, and I think the highest it was like maybe 22. Was it higher than that? I remember 22 kind of being the highest over there. And so most of the days were in the single digits or the teens, and that means you don't go outside for very long. And so we were hanging out inside with the family and uh, got to stay with Tim and Grace and with Ellie and Ivy. And it was Ivy's first birthday, by the way. And so that's why we flew back to celebrate that with them. And uh, got to see the Bargus family as well. Got to go visit the IFCA office, uh, which is there in Granville. And so it was a family trip and uh, friends and a little bit of ministry as I was able to sit and talk some ministry with Richard and uh, hear a little bit about the plans that IFCA has this year and some planning for the convention. Uh, as well as uh, the, um, the, the possibility of adding more uh, individual members as well as church members and maybe even some schools that are going to join IFCA. So it's an exciting time. And uh, we had a great time there. And just uh, thank you for your prayers. I know just uh, talking to many of you this morning, uh, many have asked how our trip was and uh, let us know that you were praying for us. So thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate that. And I do appreciate coming back. Uh, as I was uh, greeting this morning, Carl asked me if I was going to have fun this morning. And uh, what he meant by that was, it's my turn to preach. And so I'm back up here for the next two months, maybe three months. We'll see how that works out. And, uh, you know, it really is um, fun. Maybe you don't think of preaching as fun, but it is fun in a different way. Uh, we get to open up the Word of God and uh, share the goodness of the truth of His Word with you. And uh, we get to, we being the teachers, get to ingest that all week as we're preparing to uh, serve this meal to you in the morning. And so uh, it is a great time. And so I'm excited to get back into the Word today. Uh, but before we do, I want to do a little pre-sermon exercise here ask you to put on your thinking caps and see uh, what you can find in, uh, the, in commonality in some of these uh, photos here. So this first one, take a look there. And uh, of course, there could be more than one uh, right answer here. These are not just, uh, not, not like some biblical doctrines where there's one answer that's true. Uh, in this one, what would you say that you see in common with these three photos? Green, right? That's the first thing that pops out. That was the first thing that popped out to me was green. Uh, so that is certainly there if you thought rainforest, these are all rainforest pictures, but I was going for green in this one, so whether uh, it's the large picture or the two smaller photos, you see green there. How about in this one? These are actually photos from our trip in Michigan, so that's uh, Ellie, our oldest granddaughter, who is burying Josh in snow, and then I don't even know if Josh saw this picture, but one of the Bargus girls wrote that on our rental car when we were leaving Sunday or Saturday. And uh, that was the uh, trip driving back to the airport. Uh, so what do you see in, in common with these photos here? White, right? Snow, yeah. Uh, so those two were pretty easy. How about this set of photos here? Okay. Anyone know what uh, we're looking at there, what these photos have in common? Deliveries, yeah, very good. They're all making deliveries. Uh, whether they're making a furniture delivery or you have uh, Uber Eats, uh, those are actually on, on bikes. I believe that's New York City, that's interesting. Uh, you don't see that around Los Angeles or in uh, Orange County very often, but that's pretty common back there. And then a mail carrier, they're delivering mail. So they're all delivering something. They're all taking something to someone else uh, as representatives of those companies. Now, those were pretty easy to see. I want to put one up here on screen that comes from Scripture. I ask you to just take a few seconds and to read these verses and tell me if you can find what is in common with these. What is the common denominator between these verses? Here we have Exodus 3.10, therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Isaiah 6.8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Jonah 1.2, O 
Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And Luke 10, verses 1 and 2. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Anyone think they know the common denominator there? Messengers, right? They are going out. They are being sent. Uh, We see here a message from God. Here is another slide, and maybe this is a little clearer. A couple of passages more familiar. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We know that as the Great Commission. And then here in Acts 1.8, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so what we find in common here is the proclamation of God's word. They are being sent. There is some connection as well between these verses and this photo. Uh, These people are being sent out on behalf of a company and they are taking a delivery whether it is furniture or food or mail, parcels, they are delivering from one company or one individual to another. And these people are the ambassadors. They are the ones who go on behalf of the one who sent the item. When we look here, whether it's Old Testament or it's New Testament, uh, we find here that the Bible gives us plenty of examples of God sending forth his chosen people, whether it was Moses to the Pharaoh in Egypt or it was Isaiah to the people of Israel, or it was Jonah to the city of Nineveh, or it was the 70 who went out on behalf of Christ as they were going out in what I call that pre-Great Commission, or the Great Commission itself as he's speaking to the 11 faithful disciples, the apostles, as he tells them they are to go out to all the nations and to baptize people, to make disciples, to teach them all that he has commanded them, and that they have the guarantee that they would not go out alone, that Christ would be with them. And then it's a little more specific here in Acts 1.8, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. So sometimes these messengers traveled um, very far. Sometimes it was closer to home. You know, you think of Noah. He was a preacher around his home. It says Noah was a preacher of the gospel. He was there not only building the ark, but he was preaching the message of salvation during that hundred or so years while he was building that vessel of salvation. Uh, Then you think of... um, Paul and his missionary journeys. We'll see in just a little bit. He went all over the place. He went very far from home to take the gospel message. And so I show this to you this morning because it brings us back to our message for today. I will not be in the gospel of Luke. That will begin next week with chapter 11. But today we're finishing up our core value series. And so today is the fourth uh, installment of that. Uh, Just in a uh, review here, uh, Pastor Scott took the two messages on worshiping and learning. And if you recall, when we looked at the worshiping aspect of our core values, that was to praise and exalt God. And then the learning was teaching and growing, that we teach and we receive that word and we grow because of that. We apply that to our lives. And then I was up the uh, third time with serving, and that was loving and sharing Uh, Loving the Lord, loving one another, and serving within the body of Christ. And this morning, we're looking at proclaiming. That's witnessing and supporting. We understand that we have a part in this proclamation, but we also support those who do as well. And so we'll see that today. When we look at the witnessing and the supporting, we understand that it's done both locally and globally. If you go back to these verses, uh, they went all over the place, to Egypt, to Nineveh. Uh, to uh, areas that were close to home, Jerusalem and Judea, uh, all over the globe. And so we understand that the mission that God has called us to, the task that he has given us, does not just stay within the boundaries of these four walls or in the city of Anaheim or in Orange County or in our own neighborhoods. It is to go out throughout the entire globe. Uh, And there are different ways to do that. Not every one of us here uh, has the desire or the opportunity to be a missionary in another country. Uh, But we can be missionaries in our own backyards. We can be missionaries in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, in our schools. And even if you're not working uh, at your uh, job site or you're not going to school in the school building and you're doing that through Zoom, uh, there are still opportunities. You would would be surprised at at, uh, how many opportunities you have for the gospel proclamation to go out through the Internet. We know the Internet can be used for some very ungodly things. 
but it also has that opportunity for us to proclaim Christ, to proclaim the message of salvation, and it can go well beyond the borders of these walls and of this country. So we're going to focus on that for this morning. We're going to be looking at faithfully proclaiming the word, okay, locally and globally. Let me go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our message. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be up here today and to share your word with your people. And I pray that as we look at it, we hear from your word and we see what we are called to do, that we would understand the importance of it. Uh, We would see the, uh, the result, Lord, knowing that you save people through the proclamation of the gospel and that you have ordained that we as your people take this message Uh, to the furthest reaches of this planet, that we would not be ashamed and that we would be willing to share with anyone who is willing to listen. And so, Father, I pray this morning we would have a newfound desire, a new zeal to share your word with the people in this world who are lost and need Christ. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if we come back to this proclamation of the word going out globally and locally, or locally and globally, if we want to go out from near to far, I would think that these two passages are probably the most common passages when we're talking about missions, talking about evangelism, talking about taking the message out and proclaiming Christ. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And again, the idea there is that it goes out beyond your hometown, beyond the area close to home. I want to focus a little bit on Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You know, when Christ is saying these words, this is right before he ascends to heaven. He has been here on earth for just a little over 30 years, maybe about 33 years. He has fulfilled his earthly ministry. He has fulfilled every aspect of the law. He lived as, like like us, a human being, yet without sin. He felt all the weaknesses of being human. He was attacked. He felt temptation in every way. He went to the cross and he suffered on our behalf and he satisfied God's wrath on the cross for us. He died, he was buried, he rose again, and now he's ready to go back to heaven, to glory with his Father. But before he goes, he gives his disciples their marching orders. He takes them up on the Mount of Olives or Olivet. Here are two pictures here. The one on your top left is a photo of the Mount of Olives. Uh, The one on the bottom right is the view of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. So you can kind of get an idea of where Jesus was and what they were looking down upon when he told them, you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, which was right down there at the base of the hill, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. He's standing there with the last moments he has with his disciples, and he says, you're going to start right here. You see that town down there? And of course, they knew it very well. I mean, to them, Jerusalem was like Los Angeles to us. We know Los Angeles living here in Southern California. You go down a little further in California, and you would say it's like San Diego or further north, San Francisco. Cities that we know very, very well. Very important cities to the people of California. Jerusalem was probably the most important city to the people of Israel. And he says, you start right here. You're going to be my witnesses right down there in Jerusalem. Then you're going to go a little further out. You're going to go to Judea. Then you're going to go to Samaria. That was a very surprising statement by Christ, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. And even to the remotest part of the earth. He says, you start here, but you're going way beyond what you can ever imagine. You're going out to the world. This is what I want for you. This is where the message needs to go. The gospel has no boundaries. It goes out to the entire world. Here is a map of the area of Palestine we see here. Um, I I put in red each city name, Jerusalem, well, city, and then the region, Judea and Samaria. And then you see an arrow on the map that corresponds with the color, so you can kind of see the area that Jesus was speaking of. When he told them you're going to go to Jerusalem, for them, Jerusalem, they understood this was that great ancient holy city, the capital of Palestine, the city of David. It came to be known as the city of King David. It was the location of their temple. So it was that central place of worship. This is where Jesus was crucified, right outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And we also understand that in the end times, Christ will return. 
And we see that he's going to return to Zion and reign from Jerusalem, a very important city in the past, in the present, and in the future. And so this beloved city for the Jews, this would absolutely be a place to go. Of course we're going to Jerusalem. It's right here in our backyard, and this is our most important and beloved city, Judea. Okay, that's the, the Greco-Roman name for Judah. Okay, this is the region where Jerusalem was located. Okay? And so if you think of, of uh, let's say, Anaheim, we would say that we are in the city of Anaheim, but we are in the county of Orange. Okay, that's kind of like with Judea. Jerusalem was a city within Judea. Judea was the larger region, okay, the greater area around Ju uh, Jerusalem. Within Judea, you could find cities like Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Jericho and Hebron. Okay, so some very important cities there. So there you have Jerusalem. You go out a little bit and, and expand to the larger area. You have Judea. Then you have Samaria. Okay? If you're not familiar with Samaria, Samaria is the ancient capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay? That, that fell to the Assyrians back in 722. Okay? And that's important because when Assyria came in in 722, what they did was they brought in Gentiles from the surrounding areas. And they had them settle in that land. And then they started to intermingle with the Jews. And what you had happen is you had Jews marrying Gentiles. And those half-breeds became known as Samaritans. There was that combination of Jew and Gentile, not just genetically, but even in their worship. Their religion was this blend of Gentile paganism and Judaism. And so for that reason, Samaria and the Samaritans were not liked at all by the Jewish people. There was constant tension between them. In fact, history tells us that if the Jews had to go to an area north of Samaria, they'd go around it rather than going through it. They would take the long way around. They didn't want to go through the area of Samaria. That's going to be very important when we come to another point in just a few minutes. So we see there Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the remotest part of the earth. Here's a, a little chart that I found. I don't recall where I found this, and um, if you'd like to know, I can find out and give them credit and give you a copy of it. But I thought this was interesting when we talk about the remotest parts of the earth. Uh, starting early here in the book of Acts, you see where Philip went from Jerusalem to Samaria to preach to the Samaritans, and from Samaria to the desert to witness to the Ethiopian eunuch, and then from the desert to Caesarea. So you see where Philip is going out and sharing that message. Uh, Paul, we understood, started in Jerusalem, but not as a Christian. He started, he was going to Damascus, and his desire was to arrest the Christians, to persecute the way. But Jesus stopped him on his way to persecuting the church, and he saved his wretched soul, opened his eyes and softened his heart, gave him new life, and he became a powerful minister of the gospel. Peter, we see here, from Joppa to Caesarea to meet Cornelius and to preach to the Gentiles. Barnabas from Jerusalem to Antioch to work with the Gentile converts. And then Paul and Barnabas on his first missionary journey. Uh, Paul and Silas in the second journey. And then Paul in his third missionary journey uh, going through a number of cities. Now, rather than reading that, let me just show you a map here. It kind of shows you where Paul went. Now, you can see the, the different color arrows going out to his uh, different locations. Uh, the blue being the first journey, the orange being the second journey, and the purple being the third journey. And then that light blue, finally, as he went to Rome. Now, if you look down at the bottom right corner, where you see Judea in bold print, right above that's Jerusalem, you look at that and you think of what Christ said. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and look at how far out the gospel went in Paul's missionary journeys. Now, you multiply this by the other apostles who went out and shared the gospel, by Christians who were taking the word of God out, and before the end of the first century, this whole part of the world was being saturated with the gospel message. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. We start here at home, we understand the importance of the message, and we take this message out, and it continues to go. It goes beyond our land. It goes beyond our borders. It goes beyond our people. It goes to the remotest part of the earth. And we see the importance of this. You, you think of some of the, uh, the, the books of the Bible that we read. Uh, this, by the way, is a map of the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation. You read that in the first few chapters. 
the church of uh, Pergamos and Smyrna, Ephesus, Laodicea, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, those were not near Jerusalem. These are up in what we call modern-day Turkey. These were quite a ways away. The churches were there. How did they get there? Well, the word of God spread. People took the message. You think of the letters that we read in the New Testament. You think of the epistles. Right? You think of the book of Romans. That was sent to Christians where? In Rome. Okay? Italy, far west from Jerusalem. Right? Not only there, but you think about um, Galatia. That's the Galatians. Ephesus, Ephesians, right? Philippi, Philippians, Colossae, Colossians. We read Thessalonians, that went to Thessalonica. Corinthians to the Corinth, or to the city of Corinth. These are all books of the Bible, epistles that are named after the cities where the churches were. How did they start? Where did they come from? It came through the proclamations of the gospel. It came through making disciples as God's people went out and shared the word of God with these individuals. And so we see here that the word of God is to go out locally and globally. It goes out through the entire world. This message of salvation is too precious and too powerful to be contained and, and to, to be limited to one people group. We understand that this, this pandemic of sin has plagued every human being. There is no person who escapes from the impact of sin. We are born with it. We are born with a fallen nature. We are born with sinful inclinations. Okay, this week we spent time with our family and we really loved spending time with the granddaughters. And um, we saw some sin nature there too. We have a lot of photos where they're smiling and happy and, and hugging us and kissing us. We like that. There were a few times where we had to tell Ellie no, and, and when we said no, her, her countenance changed the way Nebuchadnezzar's did <laughs> when the three guys said, we will not bow the knee, and he said, turn it up seven times hotter, right? Her face was almost like, I've got a furnace for you, seven times hotter. She didn't like that. She's two and a half. You know, where, where does a two-and-a-half-year-old learn to say no with such anger and intensity? It's in them. It's in us. No grandparent wants to admit that their grandchildren are wretched little sinners. <laughs> but they are. That's who they are. We're born that way. Okay? I mean, no, no, don't get me wrong, and you're laughing because you know what I mean, and as Christians who know the Word of God, we understand that every child is a precious gift from the Lord, okay? but we understand that we're not born without the stain of sin. That, that, that comes with the package. You take that baby home from the hospital, and you're, you're happy, and you're excited, and you're just bursting with joy, and, and within a couple of years, you're thinking, what did I get myself into? <laughs> there's no, there's no, no return policy on this little wicked, you know, uh, child human that talks back to me all the time but you know what when you look at that that's in every one of us nobody escapes it it doesn't matter how cute they are it doesn't matter what what color their skin is it doesn't matter how well they're educated or what income level they have nobody escapes sin and that is why the gospel needs to go out to all the earth the remotest part of the earth we heard about Suriname since the 50s Louise has been there ministering. Why? Because since the 50s, there have been sinful people that need to be saved. And long before she was there and long after she retires, there are going to be people who need to be saved in Suriname. And every city and every country throughout the globe. That is why Jesus said we need to take this message out locally and globally. It has to go out. It starts there in Jerusalem for the disciples to Judea, Samaria, to the remotest part of the earth. The Bible is very clear. The word of God needs to go out locally and globally. We also see here that the proclamation of the word is to go out to all people. Now that might seem a little redundant. Well, of course the proclamation goes out globally. Isn't that all people? Well, yes and no. Well, let me explain what I mean here when I say to all people. Okay, again, to Acts 1.8, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. 
It, it became very clear that the word of God was to be proclaimed to everyone, not just the Jewish people. That is important when you come to the study of God's word. Many blessings are, are specifically for the Jewish people. We read about the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, and there are promises there that are only applied to the nation of Israel. But there are promises that go out through the Jewish people to the entire world. And there were many Jews who forgot that. Many Jews who knew that, but didn't want to see that happen. And so Jesus told his disciples, you start in Jerusalem, but guess what? You're going to an area just north of here where you probably think they're not deserving of salvation. You don't like what's happened between your people and their people over the course of history. You, you might like to hear that I don't want you to take the message to them, but to others. But guess what? That's exactly where I'm sending you. I'm sending you to the people you despise. I'm sending you to the people who you hate and they hate you. People that you think are less than human. People that you think are not worthy of salvation. You're starting right here at home, but guess what? You're going out to the people that you might think deserve to go to hell. We understand that that's where everyone goes. And as Christians, we think, well, you need Christ. But if we're honest with ourselves, we probably felt at one time or another, that person goes to hell, good. They deserve it. You look at people throughout history who have persecuted individuals or nations. You hear about trials where somebody is there and accused of, of murder or some other crime, and you think there isn't a place hot enough in hell for them. And we want to see judgment come down upon them. We have to kind of think about what we're asking for there, what we're desiring. Again, Jerusalem was important for them. They're, they're, they're a wonderful city, the, the, the center place of their religion. And that's where their families gathered throughout the year for various feasts and festivals and celebrating their faith and their culture. And of course they'd begin at home. Why wouldn't they? I mean, it's Jerusalem. But when he told them to go to Samaria, where the half-breeds were, where the heretics were, that could be a little touchy for them to go to areas that contained people, that, that had people living there that they did not like. Now, this came up once before in the book of Jonah. Remember, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Right? Repent. Judgment's coming. You need to repent. And what did Jonah do? God told him, you know, told him go to Nineveh, and he goes out west, heads towards Spain. He's like, I don't want to go there. Through God's sovereign power, he causes the storm to come upon the sea, and he, he, um, somehow he commissions this massive fish to go swallow Jonah, keep him safe inside the belly of that fish for a portion of three days, and then vomit him up on the shore. And then where does Jonah go? To Nineveh. He proclaims the message. He goes through there, and as he's walking through there, probably looking really messed up after spending three days inside of an animal out at sea. He goes in there, not very happy at all, and he proclaims the message. And what happens? Over 100,000 people repent. They get saved. The whole city. And when they do, look at Jonah's attitude in chapter 4, verse 1. It greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Jonah was angry that the Ninevites were saved. Why? That was the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians were their enemies. He didn't want them to be saved. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country, in my Jerusalem? Didn't I say this would happen? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and the one who relents concerning calamity. Jonah knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was trying to keep from the people who needed this message most. 
I didn't go there because I know they're wicked and I know you're a gracious God. I know their sin is great and I know your grace is greater. That's why I didn't go. That's why I would not take it to them. I tried to delay your sovereign decree to save them. It clearly did not work. Jonah, who was created by God, foolishly thought he could stop his sovereign creator's plan. He absolutely could not. God, in his wonderful mercy and grace and compassion and loving kindness, he saved the people of Nineveh. And now look at what Jonah says. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Lord, just kill me now. I can't bear to to know and, and to live with the idea that the Ninevites were saved. That's good for us. We deserve it. We're your chosen people, but they're not. They deserve to go to hell. They deserve eternal punishment. They deserve the lake of fire. They deserve everything that is in store for them. Pour your wrath out upon them. That's what would bring joy to my heart. You didn't do that, so just kill me now. Now, you think about Jesus telling his disciples, you're going to Jerusalem. Yeah, Judea, amen. Samaria, whoa. Wait a minute. Samaria? You sure you got that right? You didn't mean Bethlehem or Hebron or Jericho or some other place? Samaria? I mean, you bring that home here. Yeah, we're going to go to Anaheim. Okay. Going to go to Tustin. Going to go to Corona. Going to go to Santa Ana. No, not Santa Ana. We don't want to go there. All right, Stanton, well, maybe, you know, Stanton's got a bad reputation. How about Compton? Compton? Really? South Central? Can I do missions somewhere else? Can I evangelize somewhere else? I mean, we, we landed in Detroit in Michigan. People would much rather probably live in, in Grand Rapids than Detroit, but you know what? Detroit needs the gospel. San Francisco needs the gospel. Just because we don't like who's there and who's running it, maybe their politics or their policies or whatever it is, doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a heart for their salvation. I mean, Jesus says this goes out to all people. It's not just about you. You look at what God told Abram back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this is talking about Christ, the Messiah coming through the nation of Israel. He, he doesn't just say, and in you the, tw- the 12 tribes will be blessed. The northern or the southern kingdom will be blessed. He says, all the earth will be blessed through you. You have the wonderful privilege of being my chosen people. The Messiah is coming through you. And guess what? The entire globe is going to be blessed because I've chosen you to be my ambassador to represent me, to take the message out. You look at Psalm twenty-two, twenty-seven. 27. David talks about the nations worshiping the Lord. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. He doesn't say all the families of Jerusalem or all the families of Bethlehem or, or the various tribes of Israel. No. All the nations of the earth, all the families of the nations. That means Jew and Gentile alike. They all need to hear the gospel, and one day you're going to have a group of people that is made up of both Jew and Gentile, serving God, praising Him, and join His glory forever and ever. David says this is what it's all about. Luke 24, 46 and 47, Jesus talking to His disciples, again, right before the ascension. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Here is ground zero. This is where it starts, and it goes out from here. It's like that ripple effect when you toss a little a stone into a calm body of water. Where it hits is Jerusalem. But you look at the ripples as they go out from Jerusalem, and it just goes beyond the borders. It goes out everywhere. And the impact is great. Whether it's Abraham or it's David or it is the greater David, Jesus Christ, we understand that the message of blessing was always to go out to all the nations. It was never intended to be exclusive to the Jewish people. You know, and sometimes we as Christians have that same mentality. We're very, you know, 
selective where we want to plant churches or where we want to evangelize, who we want to share the gospel with. Rather than being so selective and, and choosing and, and picking you know, who and when and why, it should just be whoever is willing to hear, if I have an opportunity, I'm going to share. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they look like. I don't care if they live in a mansion or they're homeless. I don't care if they're living in their car or they, they have an estate somewhere in this gated community. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care if their skin is, is dark or light or somewhere in between. It doesn't make a difference. Because on the inside, they have a soul that's going to live forever. They are made in the image of God as human beings, and we know that Christ came to save sinners. Right? That's, an, that's a powerful statement. Christ came to save sinners. Okay? It doesn't matter what color you are. You're a sinner. It doesn't matter what gender you are. There's only two, by the way. You're a sinner. It doesn't matter if you're old or you're young, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. You're a sinner. That means Christ came to save you. That's the mentality we need to have. And so when we're talking about our core values here at Community Bible Church, the mentality needs to be the gospel needs to go out to everyone. And, and if God brings someone across my path and I can share with them, then I'm going to take that opportunity. But don't get me wrong, you don't always have every opportunity to, to stop and talk with someone. I mean, we work and we have errands to run, we have families to raise. And so I'm not saying that if you're not out there 24 7 sharing the gospel, you're some kind of failure. But we need to be ready and willing to share as God opens those doors for us. And sometimes we're a little more uh, specific in our planning, where we say, okay, we are going to go out today. I am going to go share with this neighbor today or this person in my family or this coworker or this friend at school. So sometimes it's very planned and sometimes it's just a spontaneous thing that happens. But the point is, is that we're ready to do it. We see the importance of it. And we're not like Jonah who says, I'd rather die than see them saved. So we want to make sure that we understand that. So, so locally, how, what are some ideas there? I mean, you know, your, your home is your, your first and greatest mission field. Not every person who's a Christian lives in a home that is filled with Christians. There are wives who are married to unbelieving husbands. There are husbands who are married to unbelieving wives. Guess what? Mission field. There are parents who have children that are not saved. Mission field. You have neighbors who are not saved. Mission field. Person who cuts your hair. Maybe they're Buddhist. Maybe they're Muslim. Maybe they're Hindu. Maybe they're atheist or agnostic. Guess what? Missions. Person at the grocery store. Amazon delivery guy. Well, they just drop off a box. Great. Leave a track for him. Leave a note out there. Thank you so much for delivering. Thank you for your service. Take this. You know, wrap it, cleanse it, sanitize it, take it. You know, be careful. People are concerned. Clean it. Put it out there. It's not a <laughs> gas station. Boom, one right there on the pump. Next person who comes up, there it is. I mean, there's so many ways to do this. We don't, we don't all do it. I don't do it all the time. I have to remind myself. I need to be a little more aggressive in this, a little more active in this. Now, how do we do it? We share the gospel with them. We invite them to services, to studies. You know, Pastor Scott put the, uh, the announcement slide up there. There's a table right back there. You can order your... your Lawn banners, the lawn signs. I mean, that, that, that tells people who we are, where we are, the service times, our website. Somebody might come by and see that. I mean, is, is that some kind of aggressive evangelism? No, but it gets the word out. Steve Esmond has put together these wonderful little booklet, these tracks. They're about the size of a business card. We have some in English and Spanish. You could take those, keep them in your car, keep them in your wallet, keep them in your purse. Give it to someone. Guy delivers pizza, give him some money for a tip and give him a card. We have resources here. Take them. That's what they're for. Uh, you know, our brother Enrique, he's, he goes out into the community. There are days where he'll text me, hey, Pastor Ed, I just want to let you know I parked my car in the, in the church lot. Please don't tow me away. <laughs> he knows I'm kind of like the, the police around here. You know, you got to be careful. Take care of the property God gave us. We have had cars that have been left here that have been stolen and just left, so, you know. And he's like, don't tell me, please don't tell me. I'm out sharing the gospel, knocking on doors. You know what? 
We need to multiply that. More of us need to be involved in that. You want to go out? Talk with them. I'm sure he'd love to have company. Go out and share the gospel. Knock on some doors. Invite some people. If they say no, in a, in a way, so what? I mean, you take the message out. If we don't share and nobody hears the message and nobody comes, then we can look at that and say, we did absolutely nothing. If we go out and we give them the message, whether it's verbally or in print, and they don't come, well, we went out, Lord. We're not the Holy Spirit. We can't convict them. But we were faithful in taking that proclamation. We were faithful in the message going. See, going out doesn't guarantee that the pews are going to be filled. Going out guarantees that we're being faithful and obedient to God's commission for us. That's what we need to do. Globally, we heard from Peter this morning about one of our missionaries. Man, decades faithfully serving there in Suriname. How can we be a partner with that ministry? I mean, that one seems like it's coming to an end. Well, as a congregation, we've supported that ministry for quite a while, financially and prayerfully. And praise God that we do. Not, there are a lot of churches today, a lot of congregations, where missions is not important to them. Some don't have any missions uh, uh, giving at all. I praise God that we do. We still get it. But guess what? Just because we as a church support financially a missionary doesn't mean that you can't do that on your own. I mean, many missionaries have churches that support them and then individual givers. And let's just say financially you're not in the position to do that. Well, guess what? You can pray for them. Some of them will communicate through email. Some can't because of the, uh, you know, the security issues where they're serving. But many would love to get an email from you. We had Brian here last week. Praise God that we can communicate with him. Hey, Brian, just want to let you know I'm praying for you this week. How are things going in Italy? How's the language training going? You know, how was that conversation with this person or that one? Any open doors? And, you know, he would love to have that. Missionaries need that support. So, so giving through the church is one thing. But taking that upon yourself and saying, we're going to do this. You know, get the missions card. Put it on your fridge. Put it somewhere. Have your family pray for them. So many ways that we can support this proclamation going out locally and globally. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 4. Look at verses 10 through 19, and, and let's see what a missionary, a church planter, what, what his attitude was towards the church that supported him. Philippians chapter 4, looking at verse 10. This is Paul, by the way, writing to the church in Philippi. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I le I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. And in any, every, every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. By the way, make sure when you use that verse, you use it in context. Okay? This is not Tom Brady on the field saying, I can win a Super Bowl through Christ who strengthens me. This is not LeBron James saying, I can slam dunk or win a three-point contest through Christ who strengthens me. Okay? What is, I mean, I just, you know, you know, you know athletes, you know musicians, you know what they say. I mean, people use this all the time out of context. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying that when I'm out there, out and about doing the work of the gospel message, I, I, I can eat scraps or I can feast, and I'll still do the work. I can live outside and be cold, or I can be in a very comfortable circumstance, and I could still do the work. I can survive that. I can endure that through Christ who strengthens me. Please make sure you know the context of the verses that you use. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Another verse that is taken out of context. 
God said, or Paul said, you provided for me, God will provide for you. You partnered in this ministry. And guess what? God's going to provide for you as well. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Listen, this was important to Paul. He said, I was out doing the Lord's work and you supported me. There were times when you wanted to and you couldn't. Understandable. I get that. But you came back and supported me with your prayers and with your gifts. And guess what? That was pleasing to the Lord. And it helped me to continue. And, and others were blessed by it. Now, I'm sure that any missionary would love to have more partnering churches, more individuals. This is part of how we, living here in Orange County or L.A. County, Southern California, can participate in global evangelism, in proclaiming the word globally through the missionaries we support prayerfully and financially. Let's look at one last point before we turn our attention to the Lord's table, and that is that the proclamation of the word is for the purpose of making disciples. Okay? Why do we go out? Why do we go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the remotest part of the earth? It is to make disciples of Christ, okay? to make sure that we are taking that message and we are seeing reproduction, that people who have been saved take the message that saves to see people get saved. That's what we're to do. I was going through a book called The Deliberate Church while we were back in Michigan, and I really enjoyed this quote, and this comes from uh, Mark Dever and Paul Alexander. I don't know which one said it, but they're both authors, co-authors of this book. Churches are the most healthy when the gospel is the most clear. And the gospel is most clear, I should say most clear, when our evangelistic methods are most plain. Right? Well, what do they mean by that? I, I think I understand. Okay? There are many so-called churches that have substituted the gospel for a politically correct message. There are many professing Christians who replace preaching and evangelism with entertainment. They employ the old smoke and mirrors. Right? If we can entertain them, we can pique their interest, then we can get them to come and fill the pews. So what do they do? Smoke machines, lasers, indoor pyrotechnics. I mean, I've seen videos of pastors coming in on wires, like, coming down to the stage and one guy riding a motorcycle up on the stage. <laughs> really? I mean, what happened to the, the gospel is the power of God of salvation, or, you know, the, the power into salvation? I'm so riled up, I can't even remember the verse, Romans 1, 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God into salvation. That's not preaching. What is that? It's like a Netflix special. I mean, come on. So many people think that you need to add these things to the gospel to make it relevant, to make it acceptable, to make it palatable. Listen, the gospel doesn't need power from anything or anyone. It is power. All we have to do is proclaim it. We, we proclaim God's word and we let the Holy Spirit do his work of opening the eyes and the ears and the hearts and the minds and convict people of their sin. We just have to be faithful with preaching it, with sharing it. It just needs to be a plain presentation. You know, when I think of this disciple-making, I come back to one passage. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, don't be nervous, this is not a new sermon, but let me just give you three keys, three essential keys about our ministry as proclaimers of God's word from 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. I promise this will be like five minutes for the three. And then I'll come back and preach a message on it that'll be two hours later. <laughs> the mission of proclaimers, the motive of proclaimers, and the message of proclaimers, that's what we see in these two verses, okay? The mission, the motive, and the message. We are to be proclaimers of God's word going out to the world globally to all people to make disciples. Here is our mission, here is our motive, here is our message. The mission is this, we are ambassadors for Christ. Okay, God is making an appeal through us. He uses us as the voice of the gospel. Okay? Proclaiming the word is a very serious thing. And we go out on behalf of the most important person who exists. 
Okay? We're not delivering food for Uber. We're not delivering mail for the post office. We're not delivering furniture from Ashley Furniture or anywhere else. We are delivering the gospel message on behalf of the God of all creation to people who need to be saved. Okay? You know, this idea of being an ambassador comes from the same word that we get elder, okay? presbyumon. And we think of elders, we think of people in the church, men in the church. We think of men who have to be qualified according to 1 Timothy and Titus. And not everyone's called to be an elder. Well, that's true. But every Christian is called to be an ambassador. It's a little different here in the context. The, the word is very similar, but the mission is quite different. These are men, women, and children. Anyone who's saved is an ambassador for Christ. And we go out as, as old converts and young converts and somewhere in between, and we tell people, I was saved. I was a sinner. Christ was merciful and gracious. He saved me. Here's that message. You need salvation as well. You can have this great hope. So that is our mission as proclaimers, is to be ambassadors for Christ. Well, here's the motive. It's to see people be reconciled to God. We want people to be right with God. You know, as I mentioned, so many messages, too many messages that are called the gospel are nothing more than politically correct, self-help, feel-good, prosperity, trash. And those words are probably not strong enough. I mean, there's just a lot of rubbish in this world that's called the gospel. We need people to know that they need to be saved. They need to be right with God. Here's another quote from the deliberate church. We don't want people to become Christians because it will reduce their stress. We want them to become Christians because they know or they need to know that they need to repent of their sins, believe in Jesus Christ, and joyfully take up their cross and follow him for the glory of God. You got to get right. This path, this new life in Christ is not going to be easy. You're not going to be guaranteed financial prosperity. You might not be healed from that disease. Your husband or wife might not stop nagging you. Your children might not be obedient, but you'll be right with God. That's the important thing. And then you pray that all these other things fall into place, that the Lord will be gracious and, and bring salvation to them as well. But listen, ultimately, people don't need world peace. They need spiritual peace with the one who will wage war against their souls. Ultimately, people don't need a living wage. They need living hope to know that they have an inheritance with God in his kingdom. Ultimately, people don't need others to accept their, their flawed and perverted ideas of their identity. What they need is new life in Jesus Christ to become a new creature in Christ. Okay? Ultimately, people don't need to be socially or politically reconciled to one another. They need to be reconciled to the God they've offended and who will condemn them in the lake of fire forever. Now, that's not to say that these other things in the world that we shouldn't pursue, doesn't mean that we shouldn't pursue peace with other nations or people. We should, but that's not the eternal perspective. It doesn't mean that we don't want people to earn a comfortable wage and to be paid what they're worth and be able to, to live outside of the, or above the poverty line. That's important, but not when you die and you stand before God. See, we need to have our priorities right to understand that the, the temporal is never as important as the eternal. We don't write those other things off. Uh, th those are endeavors that we can be part of and we want to see some, some growth and some advancement and some, you know, some success and, and joy in those areas. But those things ultimately are not going to make you right with God. And when you stand before God in judgment at the, the great white throne and find yourself in the lake of fire where there's no escape, I guarantee you that whoever was in the White House is not going to be on your mind. And whether or not you made $15 an hour or $200 an hour is not going to be on your mind. What's going to be on your mind is I missed my opportunity to get right with a God who was justfully and righteously punishing me. I had a chance and I blew it. That's what's important. That's the reconciliation we're talking about here. Well, here's the message to proclaimers. Okay? A couple weeks ago, I'm sure you heard about GameStop. I mean, it went through the roof. People got a lot of money, and people lost a lot of money. Right? I mean, it just, it's very interesting to read that. It skyrocketed, and people made and lost billions. 
That was a very interesting transaction of those transactions that took place. I mean, people are still scratching their head and they're looking like, was that legal? Was it not legal? I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I missed that. And I praise, you know, they might not say praise God. Maybe they do. Like, thankfully, I was part of that. Uh, if they made money. Listen, I'll tell you what, there is a transaction that took place so much more important, so much more valuable than what happened here. And this is, we're talking about billions. People made billions on this. You know what it was, though? Here's the greatest transaction that the world has ever known, the most valuable transaction that's ever taken place. He, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ the Son, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the greatest transaction. That's the simple and clear message of the gospel, that God makes you right through his son, Jesus Christ, that he is the righteousness that we need, that we as fallen people, as sinful people, as unrighteous people, in our nature and in our actions, we deserve to be punished by God. But God makes a way of salvation. God in his grace and love and mercy and patience and loving kindness has given us a way out. And I'll tell you what, this, this transaction on the cross makes the game saw, or stop transaction, that surge, look like finding a penny after slumming in the sewers for 100 years. Nothing. I mean, and imagine having a billion dollars in your account. Nothing. It means nothing compared to salvation in Christ. One more excerpt from the book and then we'll wrap it up here. Yet the gospel is not ultimately about me. It's about making his holiness and sovereign mercy known. It's about God's glory and gathering worshipers for himself who will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's all about God vindicating his holiness by punishing Christ for the sins of all those who repent and believe. It is about making a name for himself in the world by gathering a people and separating them to himself for the spread of his fame to the nations. It's all about God. But guess what? When you're right with God, all the wonderful blessings and glory that God has in store for his people are poured out upon you. You receive a tremendous amount, an amount of glory and, and just wonder and joy in his kingdom that you cannot even comprehend. And it's waiting there for you if you're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. That's the message we need to proclaim. So what do we learn this morning as we wrap it up? As a congregation, we should be faithfully committed to proclaiming the word of God uh, locally and globally. As a congregation, we start here in our Jerusalem. We go out to Judea and Samaria, the remotest part of the, world, of the earth. We continue to support our missionaries and pray for them, and I would encourage you to do that on your own, not just through the ministry. And take the opportunity to share the word of God to everyone and anyone who is willing to hear. Don't pick and choose who you think is worthy of the gospel message. We need to go out and be faithful as his representatives, as his ambassadors, and fulfill this great task that he's commissioned to us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this morning and for this opportunity to look at your word and to see uh, what you have called us to be. Your ambassadors here at home and throughout the world to proclaim Christ and to see people saved. We thank you, Lord, that you have entrusted us with such a wonderful message and a wonderful ministry. Father, I pray that we continue to have this, this uh, right perspective at Community Bible Church, and I pray that everyone here who calls this congregation home, that we will all participate in this in some way or another uh, as individuals and corporately as a body of Christ. Thank you that you've opened our eyes to the wonderful message of salvation through your Son. And I pray, Lord, that we have the wonderful hope and joy and love and mercy and compassion on others that you have had upon us so that we will not hesitate to share the gospel with them and see their lives uh, completely transformed through the power of the gospel. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.